Oh boy. Well, it's time to use that singing voice. Let's see what we got here for the Sunday night service. Uh, let's stand together as we sing our first song tonight. It is All Hail the Power, number 45 in your hymnals. can hail him, our everlasting king. Uh, Bill and I were talking yesterday about uh, the crazy political situation going on, and uh, Bill made a good point. Regardless, God's still on the throne, right? He's still in charge, and, and no matter what happens, no matter which way things turn, no matter how bleak things may be, God is always in control, and he is our majestic king. So with that, let's go to him in prayer, and we'll prepare for worship today. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are Lord of all, and Lord, we do thank you that we have the opportunity for the everlasting song that will sing your praises in heaven on high. So Lord, in the meantime, help us to serve you faithfully, to love you as our heavenly father, and Lord, to uh, get as many people as we can to join us in heaven through salvation in Jesus Christ. So Lord, I thank you that we have every opportunity we have to love you more. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We'll turn to our next song this evening, and it is I Sing the Mighty Power of God, number 11.
keep up. Even the slides got out of hand there, and I think it's operator error, but we'll attribute it to that. But good job as we continue uh, singing this evening. As you can see, God's majesty, God's sovereignty is the theme of what we're singing tonight. A little bit in a few moments here, we'll be in 2 Samuel 5 as we see the coronation, David, king of Israel. And again, as we look at those things, we'll think about, well, what does David being made king have to do with me, with the struggles I have each and every day? And we'll see that in just a few moments here. We'll continue on. Uh, we had our soul winning Sunday today. Looks like uh, some mixed results. I tell you what, the seed was sown. So, all right. So no matter what happens, you never know what's going to happen. I have a friend, uh, his name's uh, Chris Albrecht. I haven't seen him in a number of years. Uh, Christian man, a God-fearing man, a uh, 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 serving the Lord, but uh, he got saved from a gospel tract in a truck stop bathroom. So you never know, okay? I was in the restroom, I saw the tract in there, picked it up, read it, and he said, I need this. This is exactly what I need. And he got saved right then and there. So don't, don't be afraid of the seed that you're sowing. Uh, you know, God gives the increase. God knows what he's doing. And, uh, you know, just keep on keeping on is all we can do is stay faithful. God's expectation is exactly that, that we just faithfully sow the seed. So I'm glad everybody that was able to be able to go. Thank you for those who prayed. And we'll just wait and see what the Lord's going to do through that faithfulness. All right, let's get into October. I am excited. We got a number of ladies signed up for the ladies retreat on October 18th and 19th with Rachel Harrison. You are going to love her to death. She's just the sweetest person, uh, very wise, uh, wonderful person, and I'm, I'm glad that we got some ladies going to that, and that's going to be a good time. So, men, while the ladies are away, would you play, pray for our ladies at the ladies' retreat? Uh, God would continue to do his work in hearts and lives, and then reciprocate that favor for the men as we go to men's camp um, on October 24th through the 26th. So, uh, 24th is a Thursday. We'll leave Thursday in the evening because check-in isn't even until it's from like 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. So we got all kinds of time to get up there, and then we'll stay Thursday night. Then we'll be there all day Friday, and we'll come home Saturday uh, afternoon. Lots of good stuff going on there. Um, I got to see Aaron Wilson, who is the director of Camp Kobiak. I uh, saw him yesterday. Got to let him know that uh, we were going to be there. He's excited about that, and we're going to see Dave Young, and that's fantastic. Uh, get to spend some time with him and just see what he has challenging uh, for us from the Word of God. And we do have some more men that are going to come, but it's not too late. If that's something you're interested in, let me know. Uh, we can get you signed up for man camp. And ladies, while the men are away, would you pl pray for the men while they are away at man camp? And then we're going to get right back from man camp. It'll be time for the Harvest Time Revival. Uh, so far, we got myself and Pastor John Flanders uh, preaching uh, during the Harvest Time Revival. That's October 27th through the 30th. Uh, this week, I'm going to work on creating some invitations and getting some literature out there uh, so we can get some people invited to that. It's a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I'll be preaching on Sunday and Wednesday. Uh, Pastor Flanders will be on Monday, and I've got another speaker I'm working on getting for Tuesday, and I've been working on some other things as well. So looking forward to that, looking forward to the way God's going to bring that all together. Uh, the closer we get to it, I realize that it's just absolutely appropriate for these revival meetings and just to see what God's going to do in our hearts and in our lives through this time we have together. So continue praying for the revival coming up at the end of the month, at the end of next month, which is October. All right, let's sing our final song this evening. This is My Father's World, number 28.
good singing. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Samuel chapter number 5 is where we're going to be. 2 Samuel chapter number 5. Tonight we're going to look at trusting God's timing. Trusting God's timing. The last time we were together uh, in chapter 4, we saw the sovereignty of God over the entire world and how it relates to David's kingship. And I thought it was interesting yesterday... Uh, talked a lot about King David at Harvest Fest and a lot of applicable things that we learned from things that we have talked about here on Sunday nights. But just David's heart in the matter. We know that David was a man after God's own heart, made his mistakes, just as we all do, Uh, but at the same time uh, was willing to confess his faults unto the Lord, was willing to be restored. That's the big thing. Uh, As we talked about this morning in regards to our loving Heavenly Father, uh, the Lord our God, And when it comes to confessing our sin unto him and talking to the Lord about that, um, it's not about going to him for punishment, so to speak, but it's about restoring our relationship with him and having that joy restored. Are there consequences? By all means, yes. There are consequences from time to time uh, when it comes to our sin, and we are to readily accept those. But at the same time, uh, you know, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, but it's to restore us into a proper relationship with him. And we see that from King David. And we've seen as David has grown uh, in the Lord and how God has used him even when he called him to be king. And when he called him to be king, the first thing he did was isolated him or separated him from the people and allowed him to trust in him and to grow into who God wanted him to be. And now we pick up in 2 Samuel chapter number 5, and we see that all the while, all this time, regardless of David's uh, mistakes and his errors that he's made up until this point, uh, we see that David was very in tune with the will of God. He wanted to trust in God's providence. He understood, even with King Saul and God's anointed, not touching God's anointed man, and uh, because he knew when it would be time for him to be king, God would make it so. And that's where we are now in 2 Samuel chapter number 5. So let's start in verse number 1, and we'll begin there. 2 Samuel 5 verse 1 says, Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou, uh, thou wast he la- uh, that leadest out of, and brought us in Israel. And the Lord said to thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be a captain over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king uh, to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Let's pray, and we'll get started. Dear Lord, we thank you for your perfect timing and your perfect plan. Lord, I thank you so much that we have this example before us of King David, is that even though there were times where he took matters into his own hands and he saw the the problems and repercussions for that, Lord, when it came to this, when it came to him being king over Israel, he absolutely submitted unto your timing and your will. And Lord, we have before us here today the opportunity where we see David is finally crowned king over all Israel. Now, you had anointed him from a very long time ago, but now it is a reality. So, Lord, help us to learn from this and to understand that you have tremendous and wonderful plans for all of us, so long as we trust in your timing. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see here again, David's life, he's got his ups and downs, times where he ran away from the Lord because he thought he was doing the right thing. He believed a lie. Times where he followed the Lord completely, and we saw God's miraculous hand come in and do tremendous things. Uh, We've seen uh, spears be thrown at him. We've seen opportunities where he had a chance to slay King Saul, and he still did not do that. But now the time has come. This is a key turning point. I love these turning points that we keep seeing all throughout the Old Testament here, and this is another one. Uh, It's the culmination of his journey to shepherd boy, from shepherd boy to king. Uh, and, and that's something that is a parallel as well, because Saul, remember, before he was king, he worked for his father and he was chasing donkeys, chasing donkeys and, and ran into being king of Israel at the time. David, a shepherd boy, the same thing, shepherd, uh, fought off a lion and a bear with his own hands and was a servant of his father, found himself in the pit against Goliath at the same time. And even though Saul was king at the time, David was anointed king, being a man after God's own heart. But now the time has come. Uh, He is finally king of all Israel. 
And it's, it's, again, it shows us how God's perfect plan comes together in God's perfect timing, in God's perfect way. So let's take a look at that as we begin. When we see in the first five verses, which we uh, started to read there, uh, we see the tribes of Israel came and the promise has finally been fulfilled. And there's been patience in God's timing. David has demonstrated, if anything, has demonstrated patience in God's timing. And there's some benefits to that. In verse numbers uh, 1 and 2, we see uh, the tribes of Israel, they came to David in Hebron, and they said, they spake, saying in verse 1, Behold, we are bone, thy bone and thy flesh. There's a unity there that comes along. And, and again, this is speculation. But we can only imagine that if David would have taken matters into an, his own hands, and we've seen similarities to this with Joab, and maybe he had taken uh, Saul over by himself and did it, there might have been some resentment. There might have been some division to say, well, we know this King David and we know of these things, but uh, you know, our king was Saul and, and David overthrew him. We don't know any of that, but we know that as David waited in God's sovereign, perfect timing, that as he submitted to that, God also brought the unity along with it. And, and we see that as they come, they said, we are, we are thy bone and thy flesh. He says, also in time past, when Saul was king over us, thou wast he that leadest out and broughtest in Israel. So they saw, they knew, they knew all along. They said, you know, I know Saul's king, but we see David's the one leading the armies. We see David is the one that is the faithful servant. Everybody knew. And as he trusted in God's timing, and he allowed God to bring the promise to fruition, we see that unity in them singing his praises and ready to come under his leadership there uh, as king. Uh, David, you know, he's been anointed by king and uh, many years prior, but now we see God's promise fulfilled. And that's the big thing, is God made that promise to David. So that I have anointed you, you'll be king. And Samuel even poured the oil over him, the Spirit's presence upon him. And he had to wait quite a long time before he finally became king. Even for a little while, he was king of Hebron, just for a little bit, until he was king over all Israel. And I've told you before, if that was me, I would have said, all right, God made me king, let's go. Get, get me fitted for my crown, get me my throne. And then God says, no, I'm going to have you wait for a while. I'm going to have you, uh, you know, be isolated for a while. I'm going to have you be on the run for a while. And I can only imagine myself being like, God, I thought you promised me to be king. Is this what a king does? How about this? I'd say, is this how you treat a king? Uh, that's not what it's like. You've got to just trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And then, you know, finally it comes along and, and God says, yes, David, you're going to be king over Hebron. Oh, no, 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 God, you're going to, this little kingdom? What's this all about? No, you promised me to be king of Israel. We don't see any of that from David, and that's a good example for us. Trusting in God's provision, trusting in the seasons. You know, his son, uh, David's son Solomon is the one that says, for everything there is a season. And, and the seasons are appropriate. You know, we're transitioning in seasons right now out of the heat of summer. It was a little warm today, but into the coolness of fall. And I don't know about, know about you guys, but I, I love the, the cool, crisp fall air especially after a hot summer. But if it was like that all the time, I would just get used to it one way or the other and, and nothing would change, but there's just that refreshing uh, air as you get out there and you hear the leaves and the trees because they're dried out and you can hear them and you, you can smell them. You know, the, the dead leaves have that fall smell to them and you put on a nice sweater and a sweatshirt and you get out there and it's just a brisk day, right? And that's refreshing when it comes to that, but you wouldn't want to uh, deal with that all along, you know, and then winter comes and it gets a little cold in that first beautiful snow. And it comes down, and some of you are really mad at me right now, but nonetheless, <laughs> that first beautiful snow, <laughs> you can hear the crunch under the feet, the silence that comes because the snow uh, is, a, is kind of an insulator of all the sound and just that, that stillness that comes with that. And for those of you that hate snow, uh, love the first 60-degree day we have in March or April where you can take the sweater off and go outside and enjoy some sunshine, right? But we appreciate all those seasons as they come, and it wouldn't be without the one season we would have less appreciation for the other. And the same thing is true here. David, remember, God is working in his life to be a king, to be a servant of the people. He learned a valuable lesson when he took matters into his own hands. Remember when he said, you know, uh, for surety Saul is going to kill me. So he goes and, and he dwells with the Philistines. And what that ultimately led in was a, a very dangerous situation where the, the, the wives and the children were taken away. Again, thankfully, nothing happened to them, but the men wanted to turn on him. 
So he took matters into his own hands, uh, thought he was getting away with it for a while, but then his men wanted to turn on him. And and that was a lesson from God saying, if you take matters into your own hands, that's going to be trouble. And I can stand before you here today as your pastor. You know, uh, if I take matters into my own hands in regards to pastoring this church, there's going to be trouble. (laughs) I see it all the time with uh, pastors and they're, and they're falling away in ministry because they take matters into their own hands. I hope you understand. I take it very seriously of just trusting in God's provision. You know, you can look at things through man's eyes and, and say, you know, especially as a pastor of a church, well, I got to do this. I got to get this going. I got to get that going. I got to stir some things up. No, no, that's, that's temporary. I could create a stir, but it won't last. Not like the stirring of the word of God in the hearts of people who need to believe. And that's entrusting in his timing. And we see that example from David. As David trusts in him, and the same thing is true whether you're a pastor or not, whatever it is in life, when you try to take matters into your own hands, you stir up trouble. But here as David has waited, we see the people are ready and willing to follow him in a throne that God has established for him. So we see that patience in God's timing. Uh, Just like David, Christians may receive promises from God that seem to take a long time to come to fruition. You know, you're really struggling and, and uh, you know, you're waiting on that promise. And, and, and a lot of times we're reminded of that verse, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And, and we may call out that verse and say, Lord, I am in need, supply my need. And God says, yes, I know what you have need of before, I, before you even ask me. And we need to trust in that. God is always working behind the scenes. Uh, you know, a good, good illustration of that. Uh, you know, for a time here, we had Jonathan and Sydney. Sydney on the piano, Jonathan up here leading music uh, and doing those kind of things. And then Jonathan got called away to be a youth pastor in West Virginia. And many people are thinking, oh, what are we going to do? What's going to happen? Well, how's this going to look? And it was at that exact same time, what is it? The hows show up, right? Out of nowhere, right? So God's working behind the scenes. You never know what God's going to do. Uh, you never know how things are going to be. Let's put it this way. Uh, You guys had no idea that uh, Pastor Joel was going to say, I'm going to retire. And there was this bonehead over at First Baptist of Bridgeport just waiting to go somewhere, right? (laughs) And somebody had his phone number, Joel Bickle's fault. Oh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, By the grace of God, he uh, prayed unto the Lord and, and everybody, and here we are today. But you never know what God's doing behind the scenes. You never know what God's working in someone's heart, in someone's life, uh, you know, anywhere. Uh, and, and we just need to trust in his timing. And we saw that. Uh, I mentioned it already. But unity among believers, the unity among the people here. Uh, in verse number three, it says, So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed king over Israel. There was a unity there as they trusted in God's provision to bring it all together, trusting in his timing. The tribes of Israel came to David recognizing their bond. And again, when it comes to the church today, unity is critical as we come under the leadership of Christ. Okay, Christ is the head of the church. As we come, you know, and you realize that as we're under the head of the church, under Christ, under the word of God, there's a unity there doesn't mean we agree on everything, but we are unified and having the same spirit as we are in accordance to the word of God. That's the good part of it. And we see that here. As God is orchestrating these events, as he's bringing these things together, there is a unity that comes with that. So now, uh, as we keep reading uh, in verse number five, it says, In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty and three years over all Israel and Judah. So for the time that he was on the run to the time that he, he was in, uh, and, and, and as he reigned over Judah, uh, then his reign in Jerusalem, as we see there, 33 years he got to do that because he trusted in God's timing. And God allowed him to do that. Now we see that the kingdom is becoming to be established. Look at verse 6. And the king and his men uh, uh, went to Jerusalem under the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in hither, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same as the city of David. And David said on that day, Whosoever getteth up to the gutter and smiteth the Jebusites and the lame and the blind that are hated of David's soul, he shall be chief and captain. Wherefore they said, The blind and the lame shall not come into the house. So David dwelt in the fort. And called it the city of David. And David built round about from Millo and inward. 
And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. So what we see here, David and his men, they go to Jerusalem to conquer it from the Jebusites, and the city became known as what? The city of David. The city of David, his conquest in Jerusalem it, it, it is significant because it really solidifies his reign and it unifies the kingdom uh, both geographically and spiritually. Remember, this place was divided at this time. Uh, it, was, it was a separate kingdom because of Saul, because of everything else going on. David goes and conquers and he brings it together through the unity of the people. Uh, you know, the Jebusites had boasted that even the blind and the lame could defend the city against David. They were mocking him. They're like, come on, bring it. You know, go ahead, take the, lime and the, uh, the blind and the lame. If you can beat them, you can have it. And David, yet, he was victorious. And the victory is not just about might. There was a spiritual element uh, that, and a statement that God was establishing, and it was this. The next part is overcoming obstacles is what it was. Uh, the Jebusites' taunts, again, show the obstacles and challenges that both David faced and obstacles that we face. Do you realize that there's going to be resistance as we move forward for God? That's just the way it is. The, the, you know, wh whether it's within ourselves and the flesh fights against the spirit, or whether it's uh, us moving forward as a body and the wickedness tries to fight against the light, but we're on the victory side, there are going to be obstacles. See, sometimes we think that uh, if we make a decision for God, that God's going to say, oh, good, you've made a wonderful decision. Whoop, here's the way. There you go. And, and maybe sometimes that's the case, but a lot of times what happens is you're going to do that, and the devil's going to say, absolutely not. And he's going to do everything he can to thwart you. And he's going to throw things in your way. He's going to try and create problems, create issues. Uh, you know, a good way to do that was, uh, you know, when we were younger, younger Christians, my wife and I, and we had a smaller, small family and trying to go to church. And, you know, the kids get ornery, the kids get crazy right before it's time to go, right? Everything's all nice and calm until about 15 minutes, time to go, and everybody gets all wound up. And it gets all crazy and trying to get them rounded up to go, right? And, you know, they don't realize that they're being the, the workers of, of obstacles or iniquities or whatnot. Or maybe on a Wednesday, you have just a hard day at work and you, you come home and maybe you just say a bad word to your a cross word to your wife and it creates that tension as you're trying to be in the spirit and going into the house of the Lord, right? Those little things, those little obstacles as you try to make those right decisions to where you would say, ah, you know what, we wanted to go, but the, boy, the kids are all wound up. They're just going to be rambunctious in church. We'll just stay home. Or, ah, well, you know what, I wanted to go to church, but I, I'm not going to deal with this right now. And you stop. No, continue moving forward. You're going to have those obstacles. David's been anointed king. He needs to claim his throne. He need to, needs to claim his territory. And yet there's the Jebusites throwing obstacles in his way. But yet he continued to move forward and overcome the obstacles. You know, that's one thing we talk about. Our pathfinders will know about this. Um, with our pathfinders talking about determining our, our core purpose. And understanding who we are in God because of the experiences he's allowed us to go through, that he's made, we're made in his image, and just uh, the skills and abilities that he's entrusted us with, and the places where he's required for us to rely on him. And as we establish that in the Pathfinders, understanding the direction they are to go, and the path that they are going to take in accordance to God's will, that helps with decisions, because when you come to obstacles, you'll know no. My purpose is to do this. Even though there's an obstacle, I must overcome it to continue with my purpose. Okay? Uh, because a lot of times you would think an obstacle is a reason to stop. And that's not always the case. And that's why you really need to be in tune with God. Because, you know, if I'm in the flesh and I see an obstacle, I'm bearing down. And I'm pounding through it. Oh, no way. This is what I want. And that's a bad thing. We've seen that with David before, but when you're in the Lord and you're, you're uh, sure of his will and you're going forward and you meet an obstacle, you think, wait, you know what the interesting part is? God's blazing down the obstacles as you step over them. That's one thing we learned about yesterday too, is that uh, when the, uh, Joshua had the Israelites getting ready to step into the Jordan, you got to get your feet wet. Sometimes you got to take a step out before God moves the waters, right? And, and you have to look at that obstacle and continue to get through it and overcome it with the help of the Lord. And that's what happened there. You see, uh, verse 10, let's look at that again. And David went on and grew great, and the Lord God of hosts was with him. David grew great because the Lord was with him. The same thing with us. Our, our uh, I 
struggle using this word success, but our, our, our fruitfulness and God's calling is contingent on his presence in our lives. We can do nothing without God. And sometimes we can get ahead of him and he'll let us get ahead of him and he'll stand back as we continue to go until we fall on our face. But that's okay. That's his grace and helping us to realize maybe we got a little bit too far ahead of God and we should wait for him to catch up and then go behind him. Okay? So let's keep going. So in verse 11, the Bible says, And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers unto David and cedar, cedar trees and carpenters and masons, and they built David a house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people and Israel's sake. So what we see here is Hiram gives a gesture, <clears throat> uh, gives a gesture of kindness, and he builds him a house. And David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel, and he had exalted his kingdom for Israel's sake. And Hiram's gesture there uh, of doing that is significant indication of David's growing influence, Okay. So we see here that, that David is taking over the kingdom and he's defeated the Jebusites and he's got his throne. And now Hiram is saying, this King David, we must extend a gesture here and uh, we will build him his house. And David saw that his kingship was not for personal glory, but for the good of God's people. Do you see that in verse number 12? Let's see that again. It says, and David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people, Israel's sake. Did you see that? Uh, you know, David doesn't say anywhere here, wow, I have finally arrived. He doesn't say, you know what? I was once dwelling in caves. I was scrabbling on the doors of Gath, spittling on my beard. But now I've got Hiram building me a house. It's about time. He doesn't say that. That's not what he's saying at all. The, he says, wow, the Lord is really doing something great. That's what he said here, that the Lord had established him king. He says, wow, God is doing a great work over Israel. And what does it say here? And he is exalting his kingdom for whose sake? For Israel's sake. Wow, God's doing a great work for his people. Do you see that? Isn't that fantastic? Uh, instead of him, you know, thinking that he's arrived and this is all for him. No, he sees the hand of the Lord. And that's the other part here, recognizing God's hand and understanding that his uh, presence is key. We'll get to that in just a moment, though. Recognizing God's hand. Uh, when, when we experience blessings in life, it's crucial to recognize that these are from God. You know, a lot of times you'll hear people say that, wow, that's a wonderful thing you got, and we'll say, praise the Lord. That's good. That's a right thing to say. Uh, it used to be uh, frustrating at times. I remember Pastor Wall, after a sermon, he'd, he'd preach a sermon, just hit me right in the heart, and uh, I'd just you know, really be enthusiastic about it and just glad for it and eating it up. And I go up there and, Pastor Wall, thank you so much. That sermon really helped me out. I was really struggling with this. And, boy, thank you so much. And you just go, praise the Lord, amen. I'm like, oh, come on, buddy. Just you know, sharing some enthusiasm with me. But I understood why he was doing that, just giving all the, the glory to God. Uh, you know, there's a wise saying that I heard as early in my pastorate. It says, whether they praise you or whether they criticize you, believe neither right? <laughs> and take, you know, be, be, beware of that. Don't buy into either. But you need to recognize God's hand. When we get a blessing, praise the Lord. When God blesses you, realize that he loves you and that gift has come from above. And, and understanding God's hand. But his presence is key as well. And the reason David is able to be blessed is because we saw that beforehand, that the hand of the Lord was upon him, that he recognized the hand of the Lord upon him, and he gave God the glory. And when you do that, you cannot help but see God's hand in everything. And that will help us as we serve others. Uh, the purpose and blessing is not for us to hoard his goodness. The purpose for this blessing is for us to share it amongst others, uh, you know, contributing that. And when we realize that the blessings come from above and that, that there's no way that we could outbless God when it comes to blessing others, you know, because if we have the mindset, you know, if, if David were to say, I deserve this, this is for me, uh, this is mine, uh, it's about time. He's not going to be willing to extend that hand of generosity. When we have these blessings, and that kind of ties into what we're talking about on Sunday mornings, about performance-based Christianity, where we think, okay, God blessed me. I deserve it because I did good. Now we begin hoarding them and holding on to them because they are trophies of our successful performance. 
Instead of saying, I'm surrendered unto God, he blesses me because of who he is, not because of who I am. And uh, God will always take care of me. He will meet my needs. So I will extend the blessings beyond to others because there's no way I can help bless God because this is just, I'm a channel of blessing, right? We sing that song. You, you, we are channels of blessing, not uh, trunkets of blessing to be held or to be stored, okay? So again, recognizing God's hand uh, and, and seeing his presence, acknowledging him will help us as we serve others. So now we see the obstacles continue. Uh, let's go down to verse 17. 2 Samuel 5, verse uh, 17. Here it is, but... Right? Everything's going great. Okay? Everything's going wonderful. And then we get to 17, but. Okay, everything's going great. But it says in verse 17, when the Philistines, who had heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, Wise, there it is again, okay? David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. That's critical. That's important. So, uh, you know, how many times have we seen that with David? David saying, You know what, Lord? He inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up? Whence shall I go? Where shall I go? He encouraged himself in the Lord. He did all of that. And, and, and this is a progression, again, of him recognizing, waiting on God's timing, recognizing God's hand, understanding his presence, and surrendering unto the Lord. And, and do you see how that kind of makes sense into where if David thought that he did all of this in his own might, this wouldn't have taken place. If he just said, you know what, I've paid my dues. Uh, I, I slept in the caves. I had spears thrown at me. If you guys had only been through what I had been through, I am rightfully king. I have earned this. Uh, it reminds me of, um, you know, created some backlash uh, a few years back, and you might remember this. The uh, USA women's national soccer team had won the World Cup. You know, quite the accomplishment to win the World Cup. Um, but yet one of the key players, uh, is a very uh, uh, grating individual, I'll say that, um, was in the parade. And, and the whole time during the parade, she was saying, I deserve this. I deserve this was what she was saying. It was very off-putting. Uh, people didn't think, well, okay, that's great. You want it, but don't make it about you. And at the same time, we see David is not doing that. If David would have said, you know what, I, I've done this, I've been through this, I'm David, you know, I played the harp for Saul, uh, I soothed him, he threw javelins at me, I fought his battles, uh, you heard the people sing the song, uh, Saul has slayed his thousands, but I, David, that's me, slayed his ten thousands, uh, I am the anointed king, Philistine, Schmilistine, I've got this under control, right? All right, I, I'm the man here. No, he doesn't. It's because of his humility, and that's what's important. It says you continue growing and you continue going. And, and I think sometimes as the more you surrender and the greater things you see God do, the more humble you become thinking, I am way beyond this. There's nothing I could do. This is all of the Lord. And that's where David is. Because the time comes that the Philistines come and the first thing David does, David inquired of the Lord. Praise the Lord. What an example that is for us. And he said, saying, shall I go up to the Philistines? And God gave him the word. He says, go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. His reliance on God for direction, even after experiencing victories, that's what's important as well. I had an individual tell me one time, well, you know, there's certain sins that I can be around, certain sins that I can kind of expose myself to because I'm spiritually mature and spiritually strong enough to handle them. And I thought, no, that's not the truth. Behold, he that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Uh, you don't need to expose yourself to sin. You need to run from sin. And you begin dabbling in those things, you know, it, it, it'll strike at any moment. And, you know, it's, it's, I'll say it this way. It's foolish to think that way. Uh, you know, be careful of that. You know, and, and he was not presumptuous, nor should we be presumptuous. You see, David, even though he had seen that victory, but sometimes a string of victories, you got to be careful. Uh, it's a light illustration, but sometimes in the sporting world, you know, teams that continually win, all of a sudden they get tripped up in a defeat because uh, they just think the wins come naturally, and they forget to take heed of themselves, and the same thing is true for us. 
So here's what we need to do. God's presence is key. We need to recognize uh, God's hand serving others. Also, seek God continually. Seek him continually. It can be tempting to rely on what? Past experience. You know, that's what we rely on sometimes. Now, sometimes there's wisdom. There's wisdom that comes with particular things. But we still need to seek God. Because sometimes we'll rely on past experiences when God has something new in the present, which we have no idea. But sometimes we can rely on past experiences or assume we know how God will work. But what does God plainly tell us in the book of Isaiah? My ways are not your ways, neither are your thoughts my thoughts. Right? You have no idea what God's got going on up here. And to God be the glory, we don't. But he, you know, we do not know what he's got in his plan or what he's orchestrating. That's why we need to seek God continually. And the prayer could be something of this effect. Now, God, I see this situation. God, this is what it looks like to me. But God, I know you're the God of all wisdom, and it looks like it may go this way, but I don't know which way it's going to go. So, Lord, I am going to trust in you. And Lord, even though it seems like it's going to go this way, if you would have me, just like David says, should I go up? God, if you would have me take this step, I'll take it. But Lord, I will not until you tell me to. Seek him continu continually. We must seek God's guidance in every day and every decision because the spiritual warfare. The spiritual warfare. You see, the Philistines, again, show the persistent enemies of God's people. You realize as long as we're here on earth, there's going to be a struggle, okay? There's going to be a battle, and we see that. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 20, and David came to Baal Perazim, and David smote them there and said, the Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore, he called the place, uh, the name of that place, Baal Perazim, and there they left their images, and David and his men burned them. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, do you see that? But fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. So see, again, the past experience would have said, Well, I prayed to the Lord, he said go, and oh, here they come again, let's go again. No, David says, ah, hold on, God, do we go this time? And God says, no, nope, not this time. You see how it's different? Past experience would have said, yeah, we charged up, we beat them. It was good. We took their images, we burned them. But he asked the Lord again. He says, no, you're going to do something different this time. You're going to go around behind in the mulberry trees. In verse 24, and let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going of the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself. For then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. Verse 25, and David did so. As the Lord had commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. So we see that. Uh, you know, the Philistines, again, showing us that battle, showing us the continual battle. There's always going to be a battle while we're here on earth. That's why we got to be careful, those that sell a false gospel of call on the name of Jesus and all your problems will go away. Is that true for Saul of Tarsus? Uh, he was imprisoned a whole lot more as a Christian than he was as a Pharisee, right? Uh, is that true uh, for many? Uh, actually, all, the, all the, those that follow Jesus, all the apostles, you know, uh, martyred for their faith. So again, uh, the road of the Lord following him will be met with spiritual warfare. There will be obstacles, but we must not be discouraged. Because if the Lord is with us, we'll have that victory. And that's what we see in regards to David's kingship in 2 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5. It's a testament to God's power his sovereignty, but most importantly, his timing, the unfolding of his perfect plan. For us, David gives us a great example of faithfulness, humility, and dependence on God. And that's the biggest thing we can learn. Trust in the Lord's timing, continue to serve him faithfully each and every day, and he will bring it to pass. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time we have together. Lord, I just thank you for your perfect timing in all things. And Lord, I thank you for your graciousness for the times where I've taken matters into my own hands, thinking I know the way. And Lord, you were gracious to allow me to go through that, but yet to come back unto you. And Lord, I just pray today as we are faced with many different trials, circumstances, obstacles, opportunities, Lord, that we would have the heart of David in this matter where we're always trusting in and inquiring of you. And Lord, that starts with recognizing your hand in all matters. It starts with seeing the work that you do in everything in the world. 
And Lord, it helps us to realize that you are in control of all things. So Lord, help us to trust you, to give you the honor and the glory, to realize that the blessings are because of you and not because of us. Lord, to trust in your timing and to continually seek your guidance daily. And Lord, as we face these obstacles, we just trust you'll go before us as we follow you faithfully. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. What a good day. Good day of worship today. Good to see everybody. I hope everything uh, goes good for you for the rest of the day. Come back Wednesday. We're starting a new series in our Bible study. Uh, I've given you a little little taste of it, but uh, you'll have to come Wednesday to see what the rest of it's about. All right. It's going to be a good one. It's going to take us through the rest of the year. I'm excited about it, and uh, I can't wait to see everybody. But until then, be safe. You are dismissed.